Hey, Brian. Uh, good morning from me and good morning also to you. It's a rare occurrence where we have two people in the same time zone on the on these streams. It's rare, but it happens. How's it going, Reed? Doing pretty well. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, like I woke up with a bit of the sniffles. Um, finally managed to catch a, a winter cold, I think, sometime this week. But uh, otherwise, doing doing pretty good. Me, my my tea, um, black tea, and everything, and a, and a few uh, herbal supplements are going to keep me going uh, for the rest of the day today. Um, but uh, yeah, how's your Friday going? Oh, it's pretty good. Uh, it's actually uh, it's the week started pretty rainy, and it's really nice out. I was out on my bike for like uh, two hours yesterday. It was fabulous. So. I'm kind of hoping it stays that way so I can do the same thing this afternoon. It's, it's been pretty nice. It was either Wednesday or Thursday this week where, as my friends in London call it, pea soup fog, the the one where you you know you, you, you can see only a, a little bit in front of you. And the half the day was completely thick and dense. And then by <clears throat> by the afternoon, the, the low hanging uh, clouds went away and it was just completely clear skies. We've had a lot more of those here in the Northwest than usual, I think, this this winter. See, those are my favorite because like in the morning, uh, you get really down. And then when the sun actually comes out, like it's the best thing in the world. You're like happy and beaming for like an hour because, oh my goodness, you can actually see sunshine. It's no longer a horror movie. Exactly. Um, I'll mention a, a couple of things that uh, we'll start out with. One, just for, for people in the chat, um, uh, as I mentioned in the, the feed, I do have a couple of new reactions. So as uh, we go through today with Brian, uh, similar to me, he loves comments, questions. So let's keep it very interactive. And um, any of the little reactions that you use on that little YouTube react button in the lower right to do the 100, the, um, the confetti claps and all that other stuff, I basically just monitor the chat. And if I ever see one of those, I have an ability to kind of uh, animate a quiet little uh, rea fun reaction onto the screen to um, show people that uh, you might have liked a particular thing. So keep it interactive with us and um, let us interact with you as much as you can. Um, but otherwise, I'll hand it off to you, Brian, uh, to give uh, a little bit of background about yourself. Um, I think this is your second or third time on uh, my stream. Second. Just the second time, yeah. So I, I've done this once before. So I'm uh, probably less nervous than I was last time. But, uh, you know, I'm still, <laughs> still sort of riding that wave a little bit. Uh, so yeah, uh, my name is Brian Grant. Uh, if you don't know me, uh, I am a, uh, a Power BI person, I guess. I've been, uh, I was actually looking at when I bought my first book on DAX, and I think it was 2013. <laughs> so I, I've been doing it for that many years, doing it a whole long time now. Uh, I, I'm here uh, in beautiful Portland, Oregon, another West Coast person. Uh, and I, I get to uh, spend all my time uh, working for uh, SkyPoint, uh, doing Power BI stuff. It's fabulous. It's it's the most fun thing in the world. I can't believe I get to do it. Yeah, and you, uh, I'll say just as a quick antidote, um, you you have two uh, one of the you're one of the few people who probably has more energy the, than me when it comes to to presenting, and that that's a hard feat to accomplish for sure because we both get constant feedback on the fact that we're we are bubbly, which is great, but at the same yes. time we probably think and talk at, at a faster pace than the average individual. Um, but I also just love yeah, your the way that you break down um, visually a lot of the, the DAX processes. And I, I've seen some of the work that you built over the years. Like, how long did that one page take? You really don't want, you don't want to know, but this was probably about eight hours to build this single page with all these little boxes and dependencies where these things auto-update, you change a value here and look at the cascading um, changes to so you can observe how the, the formula is working. It's like, it's impressive, but like, man, like you have, 45 of these pages and this one page took you eight hours. Uh, so I, I know you put a lot of time and dedication into the material that you built over the years on teaching DAX. Well, yeah, and there's there's like, a, I mean, I think you probably share this too. There's a frustration because as people say, DAX is simple, but it is not easy. And you're sitting there, once you've learned it, you're, you're thinking to yourself, I understand this, I get it. How come I can't just explain this to somebody? It's so crystal clear in my head. Uh, how come I can't just take that idea lift it and drop it in someone else's brain it just it just tends not to work and so there's like a uh, yeah. desire to constantly being to say how can i use images and animation to show you what's happening in my brain so you go oh yeah that's I, when brian says it's simple or when anybody else says it's simple you go yeah i get it i get why you say it's simple right yep and it watching the vi visual dependencies of something too to a degree and and its connection pieces i think helps for a lot of people. So it, it is nice to be able to see that. And, and you were doing those kind of things with DAX before we had the debugger, and now we have the uh, the DAX query builder and all these other things, which honestly help a ton to start breaking this stuff down. Uh, but none of that really existed before. So I'm certainly excited to see that and also just uh, to see where you'll be taking um, us today with 
walking through and um, removing some of the complexities, I think, about the, the back end of how DAX works. So yeah, we'll, we'll see ready, how I we can, do. Uh, yeah, yeah, let's. Uh, I can flip over to the screen and um, we can get started. Yeah, let's let's get this ship in the water. Let's see. Oh, I'm seeing my. Oh, I see. That's just Skype being silly. Uh, so hey, yeah, this uh, is a presentation. I'm calling this guy DAX Physics 101: Demystifying DAX Evaluation Context. Because uh, the hope is over the next, you know, however many minutes, I'm, I'm going to help you see that evaluation context. I don't want to say that it's easy. But it is something that you can understand. Uh, and hey, there's my mm -hmm. picture, which now you can see my face twice maybe on the screen. And now you really know what I look like. <laughs> and you have a good s uh, sense of what hats that I wear. Uh, okay, so let's uh, let's keep going through this. Let's see. Come on, you can do it. There we go. So a uh, little background on the presentation. Uh, people have been bugging me uh, a long time. Reed, I know they've been bugging you too. Uh, to write a book. Uh, hey, uh, when are you going to write a book? When are you going to write a book? When are you going to write a book? Do you get that quite a bit? I, I'm guessing you do. Uh, well, I... Honestly, yeah, like, and especially with quite a few publishers uh, across the board who all publish those, I, I get emails a few times a year asking about those a, a little less now, I think just just books aren't being written as much anymore. But yeah, it is a common question for sure. Yeah, so like, uh, people always want to hear that, right? And uh, they always want to know when it's coming out. And uh, so forever, people ask me, and I had some stuff happen a while back, I don't want to go into it, but it kind of like, it put a pause in my work on Elements of Dax. You kind of noticed that my content on that just kind of dropped off the map. There's a reason I won't go into it, but I had some time to think and uh, uh, consider, you know, what did I do good there? Uh, what could have been improved? And all that led me thinking to myself, oh yeah, you know, I really should write a book. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever going to read it, but I just want to go through the act of writing it. Uh, so what I decided was that I wanted to basically use a blog to essentially create a first draft. So uh, if you've been following me on LinkedIn, I've been posting, uh, posting, posting, posting. If you read any of them, you might think to yourself, this reads kind of like a book more like than a blog. Uh, well, there's a reason that's because it's sort of a first draft. I mean, whatever comes before a first draft, a pre first draft. Uh, this, you know, let me get my ideas out uh, on paper, sort of, if you want to call that paper. Well, I figured out uh, where I was going to introduce certain ideas and how I was going to introduce certain ideas. So for what it's worth, uh, what you're going to be seeing over the next however many minutes is essentially kind of a summarization, if you'll excuse the uh, Dax pun, of uh, all the work I've been doing over the last, I don't know, year or so writing stuff. So uh, that that's enough of me yammering on about myself. Let's talk about Dax. So uh, evaluation context. The first thing to know about evaluation context is that it is absolutely terrifying. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. Now, uh, the thing that's most terrifying about evaluation context is not the actual concept, but the name, uh, evaluation context. If you're a non-technical person, and I come from a non-technical background, so you know we, we, we're the same kind of person, you hear that and you don't think to yourself, oh good, this is going to be an easy concept to learn. Uh, sounds intimidating, sounds scary, sounds like there's going to be a lot of jargon. The thing is, uh, the worst part is the name. Once you get past that, the concepts aren't too bad. Uh, once you start to see them in the right light. So uh, don't get me wrong, it's tricky, but mere mortals uh, like uh, you, me, and, and everyone you know can absolutely understand it. Uh, mm -hmm. The way I'm going to say this is if you can understand a list of groceries, you can understand evaluation context. <laughs> okay, so I will say that evaluation context is a core concept of DAX. So if we can actually do the work to understand this, we're going to start to see DAX not as a giant, angry, spiteful god who is prone to whims of fury and, and destroying our lives. But instead, uh, we're going to see DAX as a simple machine that moves tables around in the way that we tell it to move tables around. It'll be less scary, right? I don't like the scary stuff. So uh, there's a problem, though. You don't just learn evaluation context. And by that, what I mean is, if you don't have the prerequisite skills to learn about evaluation context, any explanation me or anybody else is gonna give you is not gonna make any sense. So in order to help you understand it, uh, we're gonna have to understand a couple other concepts first. So even though this presentation is called Demystifying Evaluation Context, I think about two thirds of it is setting us up to get to the place where, under, where understanding evaluation context will make sense. Uh, speaking of which, uh, what, what are we going to be talking about? What are we going to be learning today? The first thing we're going to be learning about is uh, DAX table references. Now, you've probably made mm -hmm. these before. The reason we're going to learn about them is, in general, when you type in the name of a table in DAX, what you get is probably different than you expect. This is always a big stumbling block with, with me and students. Yep. Yep. Uh, so, you, uh, well, 
I've, I've got a whole slide on it, but like you say, oh, I'm counting the rows of sale. Well, you're sort of counting the rows of sale, but uh, hey, that's a little preview for what's coming, right? Okay, that's item number one. What comes next? We're going to uh, cover the concept of sub formulas. Uh, you may have heard the term sub expression before and said, oh, sub expression. That sounds absolutely terrifying. I can't learn that. Uh, you can, as long as you just rename the thing sub formula. So uh, sub expression is really just a different way of saying a little itty bitty formula. So we're going to learn how uh, what often looks like one big formula in DAX is often uh, several smaller formulas chained together, uh, working together to create a number. And if you can understand how they break apart, uh, things will make a little bit more sense. After we get those two things, we're actually going to be able to talk about evaluation context. And we're going to see uh, how the subformulas in DAX use evaluation context to produce the numbers that we see in a Power BI report. So uh, that's, that's kind of what we're going to be talking about. Let's see. I will pause in case any questions have popped up. I'm not sure. So used to Nothing so routines. far. I think no, just some, so some excitement and feeding off of the vicarious energy that you have. That's, I'll, I'll take that, I'll take that, Let's see. <laughs> okay, so, uh, hey, what else we got next? So I wanna uh, talk about where we are, we're gonna be on Dax Mountain today, right? So on Dax Mountain, there's this section down on the uh, kind of bottom left in the foothills. This is where we call, uh, where Practical Dax is. So Practical Dax is great. The idea behind Practical Dax is when you're learning Practical Dax, you are learning common ways to solve everyday problems. You're not learning big concepts. You're not really even learning that many small concepts. You're just learning, hey, if I need to do year to day, yeah, year to date sales calculation, here's the code that I write to do that. Uh, Practical DAX is fantastic, but it's not what we're talking about today. Are we talking about advanced DAX, uh, where you understand really hard ideas? Uh, no, uh, the idea is we're gonna be setting you up because today we're gonna be right in the middle of the mountain in what I might call advanced DAX prep. So you could think of this as DAX Physics 101. So yeah, it's a physics course, but it's the 101 version. It's for the freshmen uh, who are often stay up all night partying and aren't gonna be physicists. So you don't wanna give them too many big hard ideas. It's just enough to get you ready to go do the advanced stuff if you want to. Uh, I'm gonna say that in this section here, which is not advanced DAX, so we're gonna be doing advanced DAX prep, uh, we're gonna be using both strategic simplifications and friendly language. Uh, some of the concepts that you might learn at an advanced DAX class, we're going to simplify a little bit. Some of the language that you might hear in an advanced DAX class, we're not going to use. We're going to use friendlier language uh, because I'm going to assume that if you're here uh, following this, you may not be a super technical person. You may not have a background in programming. I still want you to learn it. You still can learn it. So uh, that's why we're going to be right here. So if you see, if you hear language that is not the way you're nor normally used to hearing it, that's kind of why. That's kind of why. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we were going to understand three things. The first big one was table references. First big one was table references. So uh, we're going to start uh, assuming that we have a very simple data model. So uh, we're going to say that my client uh, or whoever, right, uh, the data that I'm working with is from a restaurant. And this restaurant is probably going out of business soon because they only have seven, seven sales transactions, seven times when somebody came in and bought something. Now, we've got this table called sale. Uh, it has a shift column, which has whether they came in and bought something at lunch or dinner. It has a quantity column, which says how many of the things did they buy off the menu. We've got the price of what they bought. Uh, we also have the dish, whether they bought pasta, burger, and exactly one person bought salad because nobody wanted to be healthy. Probably because this restaurant doesn't have a very good salad, but that's okay. So we got the sale table, right? And then we also have this dish table, right? If you're uh, uh, a, a data warehousing person or a fancy BI person, you might think of this as a fact and dimension table, but you don't need to know those terms. You could just think of this as the data table and a lookup table, right? So the dish table has all the different dishes that we have. Uh, it's got pasta, burger, and salad. It's got the type of the dish and how much it costs. Now, mm -hmm. uh, what we're assuming here is in Power BI, we've set up a relationship between these tables, a many to one relationship which in my mind is a, just a fancy way of saying a lookup relationship. So if we've got this table over here in Excel, we would V lookup and use dish here to go look up columns over here. So we can use uh, any row in this table over here. We could go look up the ID or the type or the cost over here. So very, very simple table, very small. Keeping things kind of easy. That way we'll be able to see everything. Okay, so that's the data we're working with. Now, uh, I want to talk for a second about the four different kinds of tables in Power BI. So uh, uh, the, there's a big challenge in that when you say the word table in relation to DAX, it is an overloaded term. 
uh, humans, there, if a human looks at about four different ideas in DAX, they will say, those are all tables. So when you say the term table, it might refer to any of those four. So I want to just, you don't mm -hmm. have to learn these or memorize them, but I just want to sort of list them out for you so we could say, yeah, these things are different. Uh, the first one that people are used to is uh, what we call a, what I call a model table. You may have heard this a, called a physical table of the data model. This is just the table that you load into Power BI from Excel or SQL or whatever. Uh, and in my experience, and Reed, you can, you can tell me if this is the same, when I say table to a student, uh, what they usually think of is one of these guys right here. Is that, has that been your experience as well? They say, hey, show me a table, and they yeah. go over to the table viewer. So the it's essentially the 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 actual raw data that's in the model itself the un, the unfiltered unprocessed uh, cached imported uh, data before it enters the visual yeah that's exactly correct yep this is this yep. is the, the yeah you go over on the left hand side there's the three little buttons the one where you design stuff and then the one in the middle yeah, where exactly. you see tables yep. you click on that button these are where you see those tables and students they when they hear table mm -hmm. they think oh it's one of these there's another yeah kind and of like table and, and, and that's yeah. yeah exactly and like that that's when I'm referring to anything as far as like pointing to a table, that's usually the ones that I'm referring to. Like if you're doing account rows or anything else, you're pointing to the 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 scanning of you know the yes. twenty five thousand rows that are in that the model table. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Now uh, there's another kind of table that you see in Power BI a lot. This is a table visual, right? So rather than uh, yeah. clicking on yep, this yep. button where you can see these guys, you click on this button where you're designing stuff. Well, you create a table visual. I show that to a human. I say, what is that? They say, it's a table. Yeah, it is. Rows and columns, right? Uh, these two are different kinds of tables. This is a visual representation of a summarization of this table right here, right? So this has got like fonts and colors and all that good stuff. Both tables, different kinds of tables. What is this uh, table summarizing? Or what is it uh, rendering? That is the third kind of table. I call this a summary table. Uh, a lot of folks call this the result of a DAX query. So if you're in something like DAX Studio or the new query pane in Power BI and you hit execute or run and you find a little table, um, <clears throat> this is that kind of table. These tables are summarizations of the data that we load into the data model. And these get used by Power BI to draw the table visuals and also all the other kinds of visuals you see in Power BI, right? Mm. Okay, so we got one, two, three table. We got one more. So the thing is, these are easy to see. You click on that little button right there. These are really easy to see. They're just right in Power BI. These are a little bit harder to see. You can go get them in DAX Studio or the new query panel. The mm -hmm. fourth kind of table is the most important and it's the hardest to see. I call these temp tables. Uh, in the literature, you'll often call these table values or sometimes virtual tables. These are tables that only exist for just a second while Power BI or the DAX engine is summarizing your data so that it can draw it, right? So whenever you have any kind of calculation, it's gonna be creating these temporary tables, tables that just are around for a second or two, just to help summarize the data so that it could be drawn in a Power BI visual. So all four of these are tables, but they're different kinds of tables, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, now that we've got the four tables out there, the next thing that's kind of interesting is that uh, contrary to most students' beliefs, especially new students, most DAX functions are designed to work with these. So if you've got a DAX function like count rows or sum X or anything like that, it's actually designed to work with temp tables, or if you prefer the term table value, it actually is not designed to work with model tables. There's actually only a handful of functions that directly work with model tables or are maybe required to work with model tables. Brian, that's getting heady. What do you mean by that? Let me show you a more concrete example, <laughs> sort of the first puzzle we're going to encounter, right? Okay, so I'm sure you've seen this before or some variant of it, right? I've got a card in Power BI. It's called Total Transactions, right? I got little slicers down here. Uh, the user sliced down to lunch and the house special. And I've got this measure, and this is what's producing that number two right there. And it's counting the row of sale, right? So my first question is, what are you counting the rows of? Well, what do you mean, what am I counting the rows of? It says in the code right there, I'm counting the rows of sale. That's what it says in the code. I'm counting mm -hmm. this thing, right? I loaded a table. I called it sale. I brought it in from Excel or whatever. Uh, this is what I'm counting the rows of. I can go see it in the top left corner of Power BI. Well, you're actually not. What you're counting is a logical copy of that table, a temp table, if you prefer that term, or a table value. So when you've got this function count row sale, even though it says sale right there, 
you're not directly counting the sale table in your data model. What you're counting is a logical or a virtual copy of it that has had columns added and rows removed. Uh, why? What, why is it doing that? Well, because uh, the count rows function, here it's returning two because we've switched down to lunch and we've sliced down to lunch and dinner. If we were to count the rows of this, we would get seven, which includes a bunch of dinner rows and a bunch of rows for things that aren't the house special. Because we need our calculations to respond to slicers, what we're actually mm -hmm. counting has to be this filtered version, right? That's That Very always true. throws people off. What's that? Was it very true? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's doing it's reprocessing. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So what you're counting the rows of, even though it looks like you're counting the rows of sale, you're not. You're counting the rows of a logical copy, right? And by default, most of the time, whenever you make a table reference in a function in DAX, most of the time, what you're going to be getting is one of these uh, logical copies of the table. So uh, as I said before, uh, the logical copy is filtered down so that uh, when users click on things like slicers, that uh, copy is filtered down to whatever the user clicked on. Also of interest, yep. even though uh, we're counting the rows of sale, quote unquote, you'll notice we've got one, two, three, four rows from sale. These are all the sale rows. There's also these rows from dish. Well, those rows, th th those columns aren't in the sale table. Well, that's because when we got that logical copy, Dax added these extra columns so that if we were to click on a slicer for something that isn't on sale, like this dish type, it's got these extra mm. columns to catch those filters. Catch those. And filters. there's, there's, and I'm sure you'll you'll get to this, but this is also, uh, this is foreshadowing one of the reasons why you should be very careful about filtering on a fact table, because you get the whole fact table plus every associated column from every dimensional table, and even, you you might wonder like why did that just take 25 seconds, but then you should also somewhat be impressed that the computer managed to materialize yes. a 25 million row, 45 column wide table in about 25 seconds in, in RAM. That's exactly correct. Yeah. So in this little teeny tiny data model, uh, there's seven transactions and there's one lookup table. It's got three columns on it. If you think of something like AdventureWorks, well, the, 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 the transaction table, the fact table, it's got like, you know, all these rows in it. And there's so many lookup columns that get added in this process. It's, it's amazing that it works at all, that the computer doesn't catch fire. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so this seems very weird, uh, and it's a little weird, but it's also very Excel-like if you're an Excel user. I've been using Excel for a while, right? So let's just pivot over to Excel. Again, more data puns for me. Uh, let's assume in Excel uh, that we, we, we open up a new Excel worksheet, and in the cell A1, we add a little formula 2 plus 3. What is 2 plus 3? Uh, last time I checked, it's 5. So we get 5 in that cell, right? Now, here's the thing about that cell. That cell A1 actually has lots of pieces of information in it. I'm listing out a few of them here, and I'm not using the exact precise names, but in a given cell in Excel, there's lots of information. So like cell A1, it's got a cell name, uh, A1. Uh, it's got the formula for that cell. Whatever you typed in there, that information has to be stored in the cell. It has the row number. It also has the column number of whatever cell we're in. So every single cell has got all this different information in it, and yet, when we type A1 into a formula in some other cell, what do we get? Well, we get the five, right? We get the value. We don't actually have to specify it with our cell reference here that when you go look in A1, even though there's all this information, mm -hmm. I want you to get the value. Excel is convenient, convenient enough that when you type in A1, it assumes that you want to get exactly one piece of information out of that cell, the value, right? That's because 99% of the time, this is exactly what you want. However, there are other times when you might want to get the row number, or you might want to get the column number, or you might want to get the formula. In those situations, you could use other functions like row or column or formula text to use that exact same cell reference to reach into the cell and grab one of the other pieces of information, right? Mm -hmm. So what does this have to do with uh, DAX? Well, let's assume we've got this simple table here, a little boring sale table, right? In this table are actually lots of different things that we could get. The table has a name. Uh, inside that table is also a list of the columns. That's part of the metadata of the table. You can also, inside of that table, grab an unfiltered copy of the table, or you could grab a filtered copy of the table. There's lots of different stuff you can grab. And yet, when you type in the name of a table anywhere in DAX, most of the time, what it's going to give you is that filtered copy, right? This is what you want 99% of the time. 
If instead you want an unfiltered copy or you want a list of columns, you've got other specialty functions like remove filtered or all or is filtered. These use mm -hmm. that exact same table reference to go grab the other stuff, right? So this is uh, very confusing to folks because if most folks think once they finally figure out, oh, uh, when you type in the name of a table, you get this filtered copy. And then they start to think about how functions like remove filters or all works. And it just doesn't make sense. That's because sometimes you could use these specialty functions to go grab the other stuff. But most of the time, what do you get? You get that filtered copy, right? Exactly. Oh, yeah. So, 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 so. I want to talk about how DAX get to that filtered copy because it's going to be meaningful for what we're doing in an evaluation context. It's pretty easy. Uh, SQL folks will understand it. Excel folks will understand it. It's not that complicated, right? So let's talk about how we get that filtered copy out of sale right there. Three simple steps. The first step I call the simple copy. It just makes a copy of whatever table uh, you asked for. So if we've got this sale table right here, this is going to make a copy of it, right? Excel folks are going to recognize this as copy paste, right? SQL folks will think of this as sort of like a select star from sale. You're just selecting all the columns from that table, right? That's step number one. Step number two, I call the super lookup, although you may have also heard it called table expansion. Both names are just fine. The idea here is DAX is going to use the relationships between the tables to go look up all the columns it can. Because the sale table is allowed to look up things from DISH, right? DAX is going to look up all these columns over here. Right? This is sort of like a left join on relationship. Or if you're an a Excel person, it's kind of like a bunch of VLOOKUPs. And it looks like this, just sticking all these columns on the end. Right? OK, so why does it do that? Well, that's where the third step comes in. This is what I call auto filtering. So in this last step, we apply all filters from things like slicers. So if we got these slicers over here where a user has clicked on lunch and how special, we're going to filter this thing down. And when we do, we're going to keep all the rows that are lunch and we're, or we're going to get rid of all the rows that uh, the shift does not equal lunch and get rid of all the rows where the type does not equal how special. And we get our filtered copy right there. Right. So uh, by adding these extra columns onto the end, by expanding the table, inflating it like a balloon, we add columns that allow us to apply filters from columns other than on the sale table. Right. So. Uh, Excel folks will notice, will recognize this as clicking on the little filter buttons to filter things down. <laughs> SQL folks uh, will recognize this as sort of a where exists, or also, if you want to be even fancier, a semi join, right? Now, uh, there's one more thing I want to insert here, because it's actually why I'm showing you all this stuff, right? My illustration now makes it look like you click on the slicers, and those slicers directly filter the columns right here. There's actually a thing in the middle. And by a thing, uh, I mean uh, a context. And uh, all I mean by that is because applying these filters is so important, DAX actually maintains a list of what filters to apply. And the list of filters to apply has the very fancy name of a filter context. So when you click on slicers anywhere on your page or do any other kind of filtering stuff, what's happening is uh, DAX is putting filters into the filter context. It's maintaining this list of filters to apply. So when I click here and here, DAX says, oh yeah, I'm gonna write this down. That way I remember to apply a filter for lunch. I'm gonna write this down. That way I remember to apply a filter for house special. So uh, when these filters are being applied in this filtering step to get our copy, uh, the way that DAX knows what filters to apply is it looks in this thing called the filter context, which is just the list it uses to keep track of what filters to apply, right? Mm -hmm. And that's all filter context is. I know, I know we're gonna do evaluation context a little later properly and we're getting into it a little bit now, but filter context, it's just a list of filters. That's it, right? So uh, one thing you may be noticing is that the filters don't look like you're used to, probably. So in DAX, filters are tables. This doesn't make any sense to a human that a filter for lunch would have this weird little table where it says <laughs> sales shift lunch. Uh, however, for a database, this makes perfect sense. And more importantly, it's really, really fast. And because we want our models to be super duper fast, that's why DAX uh, keeps track of its filters in this way as tables, right? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay. So, 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 so. I want to point out that if you have any function that responds to slicer selections, functions like sum or min or max or average or distinct counter values, any function that you use 
that pays attention to the slicer selections where the number changes uh, when you click on slicers, buried inside that function somewhere are these three steps. These are the three steps that DAX uses to take the uh, filters from things like slicers and actually apply them so that we get different numbers when we click on the buttons. Uh, yeah. Any, any questions uh, out in the chat? I, I tend to be kind of a steamroller. No, I am uh, a few comments about, um, from, from Greg, just on the, 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 you know, some of the, the amazing speeds of hardware on being able to process this at, uh, millisecond speeds with all of this. The one thing that I've also it's, just, uh, yeah. as a comment for me is just on, on filter context is sometimes referred to, uh, I believe as, as well in like Microsoft docs is the 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 query context that comes automatically from the visuals essentially it's it's everything that's on the page from your cross filtering um yeah. slicers filters any, anything that users click that applies a change that that's absolutely correct the, the slicers tend to be the easiest for students to sort of understand yeah. but also things like the filters pane that'll do it cross filtering you click on a slice in a pie chart the other stuff on the page filters all those things are doing the same way they're all putting filters in the filter context yeah, yeah, even even the, the the bookmarks that can apply them, the the drill through, in, anything that is applying in to the visual that you're looking at, an external filter to a degree, some other object on the report canvas that is applying additional filters to it. That's right. That's absolutely correct. Yep. Yeah. Yep. yep. Okay. So uh, I, we've talked about a lot of stuff. You actually don't need to remember all of it. There's really just two pieces of information I want you to remember from this section. Number one, uh, most table references in Dash create a filtered copy of the table. So if you do count row sale, DAX has given you a copy of that sale table, a logical copy, where columns have been added and filters have been applied. You're getting that filtered copy. How does it know what filters to apply? Uh, DAX keeps a list. DAX says, hey, when I go do filtering, I'm going to go look in this thing called the filter context, which will just tell me all the filters that I need to apply. And that's it. That's all you got to remember from this section. Okay, let's keep on plowing through. And now we're going to talk about sub formulas. I love this section. Okay. So uh, we've got our table references. Let's go talk about subformulas. So most DAX formulas actually contain one or more subformulas in them, subformulas, right? These are just small formulas inside a larger formula. So if you've ever written a formula, you can also write a subformula. This is the little teeny tiny formula inside the bigger formula. Now, uh, in the documentation, you won't hear these called formulas and subformulas. You'll hear them called expressions and subexpressions. I find when I use those terms for students, uh, and, and Reed, you can tell me if you, your experience matches <laughs> this, uh, I say, oh, well, that, what are you typing in there? Oh, it's an expression. They freeze up, right? Unless they come from a strict programming background, they don't know what an expression is, and they feel kind of dumb because I just used a word like everybody else on the planet but them knows what that word is. Uh, you don't have to know what that word is. If you've ever written a formula in Excel, it's basically the same thing, right? And in DAX, our formulas can contain little smaller, tiny formulas in them. I'm sorry, I said I was yeah, going to ask a question, that I kind of steamrolled I, over that. Yeah. yeah, no, it's fine. It's um, I've I've used not quite sub formulas, but I've used sub queries because a lot of people I've taught have certainly had had a bit of uh, like a database background. So like, if you've written a view yep. and you know that time where you need to like have a smaller table cached inside of the view to as part of some inner join or something like that, like similar thing. Like there are steps to logic. There are some ifs. There's a inner part. That has to do that has to yep. do math first, and then there's the second math and the third math. That's basically what you're doing here. Is you're you're applying logic at layers of an you know, and maybe go for the fun analogy with Shrek of like layers of an onion. Yes, that's exactly right. Yep. Yeah. And I think w one of the ways that I, I think you know a new person they they're sitting next to somebody who's a DAX expert, and uh, there's a giant mountain of code, and the person just goes <laughs> yep 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 yep. They're like, how did you do that? Well, it's because the person usually is able to spot the subformulas and see how the layers of the onion interact. Yep. They can look at one layer at a time. So it's not difficult for them because they know how to make the little pieces bite-sized, right? Okay, so let's talk about those subformulas. There's just two kinds that we care about. The first kind is a per row formula. This is the subformula that runs once per row of a temp table, right? Just a little formula that's gonna run for every single row. The second kind is a new filters formula. This is a sub formula that runs with some new set of filters. This is a little abstract. Let's make this a little more concrete. We're gonna start with the one on the left, per row formulas. So here we've got some iterators. We've got the sum X function, the average X function, the max X function. Here's the way iterators like this work with the, the little X functions. Argument one is instructions for creating a temp table. 
right? So when I said before, when you type in sale, you get that filtered copy. So when we type in sale here, we're giving some X a filtered copy that looks like this. These here, those are instructions for producing a temp table like this. Uh, these here, these are kind of goofy instructions for producing a temp table like this. Argument one in mean, all these functions is just some set of instructions that produces some temp table. It doesn't actually matter what temp table it is, but it does have yeah. to produce a temp table. Otherwise, we'll get an error. Okay. So once we've got these tables, uh, what do we do? Well, that's where argument two comes in. Argument two is a per row formula. It is a formula that's going to run for each and every row in the temp table we give it. So here, when we type in sale quantity times sale price, this is a per row formula that will run for this row and for this row. And since this is a sum X function, it's going to run for both rows, get some numbers, and then sum them up. Here, this is a per row formula that's going to run for each and every row of this table. It'll produce a number for each and every row. And since this is the average X function, it'll average those numbers up. Down here, this is the uh, max X function. So this per row formula is going to run for each and every row of this temp table right there. And then uh, when it's done, it's going to find the biggest value. So whenever you're working uh, with one of these X functions or any iterator, one of the arguments that you type in is a per row formula, a formula that's going to run once per row, right? That can be confusing to folks because if you come from an Excel background, when you type something into an argument like this mm -hmm. in Excel, it resolves the formula and then passes in a number to the function. That's not what we're doing in DAX. We're saying DAX, here's a formula. I'm giving you the formula and I want you to run it for each and every row. That, that often causes a lot of confusion for students in my experience. My favorite analogy that I use, because I have a similar little, um, uh, I, I like to have those little mini tables as you show, and I usually approach the the, the X functions, which is a great way to, to yes. show any kind of iterators. Um, and it's the average sales per day is usually what I use. Like, I mean, if you just try to average the sales column here, here we have four rows and you know two sales per day. If we average this, we're not getting average sales per day. We're getting just right. overall average sale amount. But if you- right. Exactly. Have a subquery that subtotals and does that and you can you can see like the little collapse table kind of going into the mini query and, and down the that's one of those oh yeah okay that makes total sense where we're building a logical table first and it's doing calculation a then calc b yep which makes sense because you're as you say you're not going to want to always you're usually not going to want to do averages on the raw data because usually that's one row per transaction which doesn't really make any sense you want to do one you know you want to do sales per day or sales per city or sales per product or something like that. And so you have to build that initial table first of all the products or all the cities, and then you can run the formula for each and every one. That, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, so we've got our two kinds of, oh, I'm sorry, we don't have our two kinds yet. We've got our one kind. So, okay, so mm -hmm. those are the per row formulas. Let's talk about the new filters formulas, right? So here we have the calculate function, right? Every time you write calculate, the first argument that you type in is always a new filters formula. Right. This is just some formula that we want to run with a new set of filters here. I want to run. Oh, I'm sorry. Argument two is how we want the filters to be different. So here we're saying I want to run this sub formula. But when I do, I want to make the filters different by removing any filter on sale shift here with this one. Uh, I want to run this sub formula. But before I do, I want to change the filters uh, by adding a filter that looks like this. These are just instructions for some table and it'll add it as a filter. Right. Here, I've got uh, this uh, new filters formula right here. I'm saying I want to run this sub formula, but only after I add a filter that looks like that, right? So argument one with calculate, what is the formula you want to run after the filters have changed? Argument two of calculate or two plus, how do you want the filters to be different, right? Just like with uh, iterators, and probably even more so, it's very difficult to convey to folks that what we're typing in here to the first argument we're not giving the calculate function a number. We're not saying go count the rows of sales, give that to calculate and calculate's gonna do something with that number. No, we're saying, hey, calculate, here's a formula. I'm gonna give you this formula and I want you to change the filters and then run the formula. Very confusing for Excel folks, but it's not that hard to wrap your head around once you start thinking of it as its own little formula and not just a number, right? Okay, Absolutely. so. We've got our per row formulas, formulas that run once per row of a temp table, and our new filters formulas, sub formulas that run with new filters, right? Those are the two kind of sub formulas we care about. Now, uh, you may be thinking to yourself, what's with the non technical names, right? The reason I'm using these very friendly names is because a student's often going to ask me, hey, what am I writing here in SumX? What am I writing in Calculate? I can tell them it's a per row formula, and I can also tell them it's a new filters formula. 
in my experience, I wouldn't say that light bulbs go off and they instantly get it, but they don't get scared. They don't get intimidated. And they say, all right, a formula that runs once per row. Yeah, it is a formula that runs per row, once per row. All right, a formula that runs with some new filters. Yeah, it is a formula that runs with some new filters. If I use more technically accurate names, like a multi-row contextualized scalar value sub-expression or a filter contextualized scalar value sub-expression, those names are very, very technically accurate. But for new students, they, they're not meaningful. They're, 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 they're intimidating and they don't convey information. They're not bad names. People need to have very precise language once you get really good at DAX. But if you're new, the names per row formula and new filters formula, those are just fine. They convey the idea properly. Okay. Yeah, it, it, exactly. And there, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I like the you know the term syntax sugar, and I to, to a degree, I think I, there are ways to, you know, using that Star Trek approach of the you know super co complicated theory and it's like overinflating a balloon like it's yeah, it's okay yes. <laughs> to to, re to reduce an analogy sometimes to something a bit more simple as long as you give context of both um right with with some of those you know the like uh, a, a data table instead of a fact table like you know mention the fact that like in in documentation if you see something it'll likely be called a fact table but you can think of it like a data table so you you give them i try to give them the analogy but try to explain thing in layman's terms, but also make sure that if you're ever reading an article, likely it will be called this instead, but you can conceptualize it this way. Yeah, and that's really important too, because a lot of times the, the, the people that are, are learning, they've gone out and read documentation, they've seen these other terms, and now they think they've got twice as many ideas to memorize. Well, there's not twice as many ideas. You're just using different ways of describing the same idea. Yeah, It's very exactly. important that they get that fancy term because that's what's gonna say in the documentation, but it's equally as important that you give them something that they can start with that is not intimidating and also explains the concept in a way that a new user can understand, right? Exactly, I, I, yes, 100%. I agree, yep. Okay, so uh, there we go. So let's talk about uh, formula decomposition. So to help us understand this concept of a chain of formulas, what we could do is we could visually break the subformula out into its own little box. So here I've got this one big formula uh, I've highlighted the subformula. It's a little easier to see now, but I can make it even easier to understand if I actually pull the subformula out into its own little box, right? So now just visually, when I'm looking at this, I'm decomposing it and saying, okay, the way that this thing works is I've got this code right here, and then it creates a subformula that does this little extra bit over here. And I can understand them as essentially two different formulas, right? So this decomposition process, it's gonna make the formulas bite-sized and also a whole lot easier to understand. This is fairly useful when we're talking about small little formulas like this. It gets a whole lot more useful when we've got something like this, where our one big formula has a subformula, and that subformula has another subformula inside of it, a chain of subformulas. By breaking it out, this thing that looks big and scary and intimidating, you say, all right, well, I only see like two little functions in there. That's not too bad. This little rectangle only has one function in it. That's not too bad. This one only has one function in it too. So each individual block of the code becomes a lot more manageable. This is sort of like what I was talking about before, where you, you sit down next to the DAX expert and they go, they look at, you know, mount code and they go, yep, 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 yep. In their eyes, in, in my experience, they're able to break the formula apart like this. And wherever yep. their blinking cursor is, they, they can say, I know where that sub formula starts and I know where it stops. And I can see all the sub formulas underneath it. And I can see all the parent super formulas above it, right? That's why they're easy to break it down so fast, in my experience, right? Is that that mimics the, um, sort of what you see out there? Yeah. Well, and then the one thing that I, I, I will definitely say that I, I'm a, I'm an intermediate user with Tabular Editor. I'm, you know, I definitely don't do nearly as much of the fancy like full deployments, never opening desktop that that some people do with CI, right. CD, and all that stuff. But one thing that I learned recently that it actually has the, um, uh, is the peak code option, um, that, yeah. where you, if if you're looking at a, a a long measure that has a, I can't remember if it's only for variables or if there's just a, a measure reference, but I believe that yeah. either either or, or one of the two, you, you can right click key code and it shows you a little mini pop-up window of the actual like measure behind the reference calculation. So it's, it kind of does what this is doing. If you, if you need to step back and kind of see those and using the DAX debugger, it does really help break it down. So like my, my encouragement often to people is if you actually need to get better at not making DAX faster, but learning DAX. Um, Tabular Editor is actually really good for that, especially with the debugger tool. Like DAX Optimizer is great for, you know,
getting the Ferrari speed out of it for right. sure. Um, but actually walking through and seeing like how the filters work and all of that, I, it, it's my favorite learning tool just because it's so easy to step through and kind of see what happens when you change filter context with the debugger, especially. Yeah, and that's that, that's a good point too. I often see even, I mean, not just uh, beginner users, but a lot of intermediate users, because DAX is so tricky, they kind of like sidestep some of the conceptual stuff and they, they go more towards using a lot of, doing a lot of optimization, trying to get the thing really fast. And I say, well, I've done, I've, you know, I've spent about 30 hours trying to optimize this thing and make it faster. And I say, okay, well, so tell me what your code's doing. And they say, I don't really know. I got a lot of it up a stack overflow. It seems to work. I think it's doing the thing that I want. And I'm just kind of clicking around to make stuff faster. Um, by using tools like Tab Editor to try and break things down mm -hmm. and understand it, uh, that is a, I think it's, people should spend more time doing that. Because if you understand yeah. how the code works by doing approaches like that, when you go to optimize, it'll make a whole lot more sense. And also when something doesn't work, uh, you have a better answer for why, right? Which is kind of useful. Exactly. Okay. Um, I, I was a good, and just before you move on, I actually have a good question just conceptually about uh, DAX. So um, when do you think is the right, uh, what, what do you think overall it would be the right level for learners to be at to transition from simplified terminology to a more formal, correct terminology? Uh, I would say uh, probably as soon as a learner gets it, as soon as a learner has a tactile understanding of the concepts, go straight to the more advanced concepts. Those friendlier terms, they're only there to act as a step on the step stool up to those more advanced concepts. Mm -hmm. The advanced concepts, they're more precise. They will work better when you're trying to understand very advanced stuff and all the documentation is written with those. Um, so the... Once you get the friendlier language, and not just a little bit, you like you really get it. Uh, you're sitting there typing code, and you're and you're you, you click your cursor in a block, and you say, "Yeah, that's a per row formula." You click your cursor in another block, and you say, "Yeah, that's a new filters formula." Once you understand it at that sort of tactile level, jump immediately to the more advanced concepts. I mean, you don't have to like stay up at night with three by five cards, uh, but there's no reason to wait on that. Once you get it, use the advanced stuff. It's just a stepping stool. Is that, okay, is that a good answer? Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, that's yep, excellent. Yep. Okay, okay, so where are we going? Let's see. So uh, when we break it out like this, each piece is bite-sized and they're easier to learn, but there's actually an even more important reason that we break these things apart like this for understanding DAX. Uh, before I get to it though, I wanna just make sure we cover what are all the ideas I want you to take away from subformulas. Uh, number one, uh, there's one kind of subformula called a per row formula. This is a subformula that runs for each row of a temp table. Whatever you type into argument two of one of the X functions, Think of it as a per row formula, a formula that runs once per row. The other kind of subformula we care about is a new filters formula. This is a subformula that runs with some changes made to the filters. This is always argument one of calculate. So whenever you use calculate, and you probably use it a lot, whatever you're typing into argument one, that's what you're telling calculate. This is the formula that I want you to run after you change the filters. Argument two, three, four, 500, those are the ways that you want the filters to be different before you actually go run that subformula. Right. Lastly, uh, decomposition is a technique that we could use when learning DAX to pull the subformulas out of their own little boxes so we can identify them a little better. Okay. Now we're finally ready to talk about evaluation context. What, like 45 minutes in? Right. But that's okay. We're setting <laughs> ourselves up properly. Now this will start making sense. Okay. So DAX formulas and subformulas. Oh. oh. Every time a subformula or formula runs, it's gonna do so with at least one pair of lists in place, right? So here we've got our decomposed uh, uh, measures, right? We, we've pulled out the subformulas in their own little boxes. Every single one of these rectangles, every block of code has to have at least one list in place, pair of lists in place. Some of them will have multiple pairs of lists, but they always have to have at least one pair of lists. These lists hold important information that the formula or subformula might need. When this little formula is, is running, it might need information from either one of these lists. When this formula is running right here, it might need information from these lists. Those lists contain critical information that the subformula is going to need, right? Furthermore, each pair of lists is given to the subformula by its parent function. That sounds complicated. What that means is the lists that are generated for this little subformula right here, they were generated by calculate. So the new, for, the, the new filters formula that's argument one of calculate. So calculate is actually building the lists for the subformula. Over here, 
with this per row formula, right? The pairs of lists that are generated over here are created by the sum x function. Sum x says, hey, you're gonna need these lists to run. There's important information you're gonna need. Uh, I'm gonna put them in these lists for you, right? So it's almost like the parent function is handing down important information to the sub formula using these lists. So the parent function, be it calculator sum x says, uh, hey, you're gonna need some information, but don't worry. I wrote down the information that you're gonna need for you. I put it in these two lists, right? What are the names of those lists? Row context and filter context. Mm -hmm. Row context is a list of all the values in the current row. Filter context is a list of all the current filters, right? And when I, you get a pair I feel of those, there's things, almost even an extra set of quotes that needs to be on current row, right? Well, yeah, that's or, that yeah, yeah, because like because because yeah, because because row row can be so many different things. Yes, and there's also if you want to get if we if we move from a, a DAX 101 course to a DAX like 201 or 301 course, it could be the list of values from the current rows. But that's okay. This is the simplified one. We'll, we'll leave yeah, off yeah. the quotes, which should be there, and we'll leave <laughs> off the S, which should also be there. It's just the list yeah, of values of the current row, fair. right? That's fair. Oh no, no, no. That's that's absolutely correct, right? Uh, and when, <laughs> when you pair these two things together, what do you get? An evaluation context. What's evaluation context? A pair of lists with useful information. That's it. That's all it is. Uh, this next slide has no pedagogical information, uh, no pedagogical use, but you can't put this up on the screen if you don't uh, do this, right? Hooray, evaluation context. Okay, so uh, what I'm really saying here is every single formula or subformula needs to have at least one evaluation context for it to run. One pair of lists with useful information, right? Every single formula needs at least one row context and one filter context. Some of them will have multiple pairs of row context and filter context, but it needs them to run because that's where important information is. What do these things look like? Well, okay, hold on, hold your horses. What is evaluation context? A pair of lists where important information is stored for a sub formula to use. What does it look like? This is how I envision row context in my head, just a list of all the values in the current row. And this is how I envision filter context in my head just a list of the filters, right? For what it's worth, I've got my own name for the things in the row context. I call these current row values. Every value in the current row, uh, I just call it a current row value, right? And uh, what do I call every item in the filter context? My fancy name for them is just uh, filters. So it's not a very fancy name, uh, but that's it, right? Now uh, you might notice that some of these things in the row context right here, uh, they have little R's next to them. What does that mean? Well, if you remember before, uh, when we got our filtered copy of that table, we added those columns on so that filters could be applied to those extra columns. You can call those related columns, right? And in a second, we're going to use the related function to get to them. So anytime there's a value of the current row that's from one of those related columns in the row context, it keeps track of that information. And I'm just in my head, I put a little R next to it, right? Okay. Now, at this point, uh, I'm going to point out that when I say the word list, I do not mean list in a computer science sense of the word. I don't mean, oh, it's a list. It's not an array. It's not a record. It's not this or that. No, 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 no. I mean a list like the list that you find on your refrigerator. Uh, it's it, like a, it's saying like you got a list of groceries. Next to your list of groceries and your list of babysitters uh, is this list right here, which has all the things in the current row. And this list right here, which has all the stuff in the, in the, that are all the current filters, right? Very simple. Okay. So how does a subformula use the row context, right? So here, let's imagine we've got a subformula that looks like this, sale quantity times sale price. The way that DAX interprets this is it wants to take the current row's quantity and multiply it by the current row's price. Well, thankfully, we have all the values of the current row written down in this risk like list right here. So when DAX sees this, it says, all right, I'm going to go look up sale quantity. That's one. I'm going to go look up sale price. That's eight. And what does it do? It takes one and multiplies by eight, and we get one times eight. So whenever you have these call references like this with an iterator, like some X or something, what it's really doing is it's going to go look in the row context to go find those values and use them, right? So uh, anything that's in the row context, you could just go type in the name of that column and you grab it and you get a number or a text string. And you use it basically the same way that you use it in Excel. As I said before, uh, certain columns in the row context are from related columns. I flag them with these little R's right here. You can use a special function called related that lets you go and look in the row context for those related values. So if instead of sale quantity times sale price, I do sale quantity times related dish cost, it says, oh, I'm going to go look for the dish cost column. Oh, but it's got this related function. I have to go find one that has a little R next to it. 
It finds dish cost with a little R next to it and gets $5. One times five equals five, right? Uh, usually what you do with the row contest is take one or more numbers and multiply them together or add them together. Uh, but there's no reason uh, you can't do something like uh, go get the current sale dish and make it uppercase. Uh, anything that you could do in Excel, you could basically do here with these values in the row context. Uh, it's just the list of values that you could get. You can get the numbers, you could get the text strings, you could get the dates, and you can manipulate them basically the same way that you would do in Excel. Right. Mm -hmm. I'll pause. Any any questions pop up there or uh, any uh, comments or anything like that? There was one that's um, a little bit on how to do a calculation that I'll bring up at the very end uh, from Greg that I have uh, waiting. In. But otherwise, just a couple of people who uh, after watching this are uh, mentioning that they are very excited to actually uh, resume your elements of DAX uh, course. Oh, yes. Uh, that's fabulous. OK, so uh, that's great to hear. So, uh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going. Okay, so that's how row context is used. Let's talk about how filter context gets used. Uh, we've already seen this, right? Remember when we do count rows of sale and I say sale gives you that filtered copy and I say when it applies the filters, the way it knows which filters to apply is it looks in this list called filter context. That's exactly how it works. So when I do count rows of sale right here, that reference to sale, it's gonna go look in the filter context to figure out what filters do I need to apply? What filters does it need to apply? One for lunch, one for how special, and then the filtered copy we get is filtered down to lunch and how special, right? So uh, anything that you do in a sub formula that uses the filters, uh, it's going to go look in the filter context and know which filters to apply. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what is filter? What is evaluation context? Uh, I mean, I could get really, really technical, but you don't need a super technical understanding of it. What you need to know from a new user's point of view is it's a pair of lists. One is a list of values in the current row. These give you numbers and text that you use just like you would use in Excel, right? The other one is a list of filters. These get used for anything that does auto filtering. Anytime you use a function like sum or min or max, or you type in the name of a table and it automatically responds to slicers, this is the list that it goes into to figure out what filters do I need to apply, mm. okay? Okay, fine, but how does stuff get put into the lists? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a sort of abstract way of doing this, then we're gonna make it more concrete in a second, okay? So here's the abstract version. I'll kind of burn through it because it's less, eh, less interesting. So how does Calculate uh, produce a set of lists for the new filters for me? How does Calculate produce an evaluation context? Well, what happens is Calculate makes a copy of the evaluation context it was made in. So since Calculate's happening here in this rectangle with these evaluation context, Calculate makes a copy of it. And then what does it do? Well, whatever changes that we typed into argument two of calculate, it's going to go make that change to the filter context. So here we told it to remove any filter on sale dish. So calculate will look in this list of filters. And if it finds any filter on sale dish, it'll get rid of it. Then what does it do? It's got a prepared uh, set of lists, a prepared evaluation context that it hands over to the sub formula to run with, right? Okay, that's a little abstract. Let me make this more concrete. So let's imagine uh, we've got a Power BI visual that looks like this. Well, we've got total transactions, all shifts, right? And the way that formula is written out is, is this. It's calculate, uh, count row sale, remove filter sale shift. And I've also got these slicers right here, right? So how do, what does this thing do? Well, before I get into the diagram, just quickly, this is the sub formula. We're gonna go run count row sales after we remove filters for sale shift. What does that look like? Let's find out. So we're gonna start with our uh, measure in a box like this. We're gonna decompose it. Boom, pull it apart, right? Just like that. I've got these little lines here just to keep our little formulas and sub formulas separated, okay? So now let's remember that the user had clicked down to lunch and how special, right? What does that mean? That means the initial evaluation context for this measure right here is gonna have filters for lunch and how special, just like that. So this is the initial evaluation context for the measure, right? And so now what's going to happen is Calculate's going to build a new evaluation context for this sub formula to run in. So how's it going to do that? Well, it's going to make a copy of this and it's going to remove any filter on sale shift. Notice over here, we've got a filter for sale shift equals lunch and a filter for dish type equals house special. Over here in this new evaluation context, we still have the filter for house special, but we got rid of that filter for lunch. Why do we get rid of the filter for lunch? Because the filter for lunch was on sale shift and we specifically said, I don't want to remove any filters on that column, right? Mm -hmm. so this is how Calculate builds a new evaluation context for the subformula. 
And now that we've Question got this in, new- in regards yeah. to the, the, the different types of evaluation context that you're talking about. Specifically right now, you are referring to, you know, filter context, row context, um, Mojo Jojo, great name. Yeah, uh, name. Wanted to know, yeah, about the, um, with these different types of evaluation context, are they all evaluated at the same time or is it the consultant answer of, uh, it depends? Uh, I think the consultant answer of it depends. And it depends also what you mean by evaluated. Um, so uh, once once the evaluation context is built and the subformula goes to use it, the order depends on what's in the subformula. Uh, if the subformula uses the filter mm -hmm. context, that that's what happens first. If the subformula uses the row context, that's what happens. If there's parentheses inside the subformula, it just follows the order of the parentheses, right? What's kind of just used. like writing a math formula and where where you're putting inner and outer, like the you you yeah. essentially based on how you need. The order that you need it to be, it can be written in, essentially. Is that's I would say exactly how, correct. Yeah, yeah. Yes. No, that, that's absolutely correct. Now, in terms of the evaluation context getting built, um, you can make changes to the row context or the filter context at the same time. That is this thing called context transition, which is a tiny bit fancier, a little more than we're probably going to do. I, I have a slide for it at the end, but it's kind of in the add-on section. Um, in that scenario, there actually is an order in terms of whether you do context transition first and then add or remove filters, that's a bit more advanced. For general use, no. Uh, there might technically be an order, but it doesn't matter. It has no impact on how you use it. So you don't have to worry about it is the short answer. You don't have to worry okay. about it. Okay, so now uh, we've got this new evaluation context built. Now the sub formula over here is gonna run in this new evaluation context. What's the sub formula? Count rows of sale. It's just gonna give us a filtered copy and what it does, that filtered copy is going to be filtered down to how special, but it's not going to be filtered down to lunch. Why? Because the sub formula is happening in this evaluation context, not this one over here. We specifically use calculate to build ourselves a new evaluation context for this little chunk of code to run in. And so when we count the number of rows in this, let's see, I wasn't a math major, but one, two, three, we get three, which by the way, uh, is the answer that we saw in Power BI. Yeah. Yes. And, any questions about that before I show another example? um nothing else other than just yeah he uh appreciated the response that you that you gave earlier good thumbs up yeah let's see okay so uh how about adding a filter right how do i use calculate to add a filter let me show you how you do that so we're now we're going to have a measure called total dinner transactions and this time the user has just clicked on one of these slices right here the code is pretty similar to before but it's slightly different it says count rows sales under calculate just like before but now argument two, instead of remove filters on that shift column, is this thing right here, treat as dinner sales ship. What the heck is that? Before I show you uh, how the code works, let me tell you what the heck this is right here, right? So in DAX, if you uh, put a text string in the little curly braces like this, this is a quick way of producing a one row, one column temp table that looks just like that, right? So when you see curly braces dinner like this, this is the temp table that it is producing. Now, this is a perfectly good temp table. We're actually allowed to add it to the filter context. The problem is, uh, once it's in the filter context, we need it to filter the right column. And right now, if you look at the column name right here, the column name is just value. That's what you get with these little curly braces and you create a quick table like that. We essentially need to rename the column from value to whatever column we want to filter. There's a slightly more advanced concept uh, called lineage that I'm kind of skipping over right here. But generally speaking, all you want to do is rename the column so it has the right column name, so it'll filter the right column. How do we do that? Handy little function called treat as, right? So we take this mm -hmm. exact code right here, we put it in treat as, and treat as essentially just renames the column uh, with whatever we type into argument two. And there's some fancy stuff that I'm skipping over, but for new users, just think of treat as as the function that renames columns so that you could use them as filters, right? Yep. So when we have exactly. a table like this, we can tell uh, DAX and specifically calculate, hey, I want you to add this table to the filter context. What does that look like? Let me show you. So here we have the exact same member, uh, measure we were talking about a second ago. There's our sub formula, our new filters formula, count rows sale, right? Let's decompose this, pull it out into its own little box. There we go. So here's our sub formula. Here's our main formula. We got little lines to keep them nice and separated. Let's think about the default evaluation context for this box right here. And by that, I mean, what did the users click on in the slicers? Because the user, they didn't click on any filter for ship, they just clicked on a filter for type of how special. The initial evaluation context uh, for the measure 
uh, just has one filter in the filter context, this filter for how special right here, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> so like before, Calculate's gonna create a new evaluation context for the sub formula to run in. Uh, well, what's that new evaluation context gonna look like? Well, argument two, it doesn't say remove filters. What we have here is a complete set of instructions for building a temp table. So this right here is gonna build uh, the temp table that looks like this, right? And so when you give uh, when you give a mouse a cookie, it does X, Y, and Z. When you give calculate a temp table, it adds it to the filter context. So this new evaluation context right here, the filter context is going to have this added as the filter, and it's going to look like this, right? So we go from having one filter to two filter. We give calculate a Question. temp table, and it adds it to the filter context. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, let me. Uh, where did my little you go so well yeah the uh the window that i had to pop this up i'm just gonna do this real quick and here it is uh -huh. grab it so pop it up there there we go so can you not just filter by putting the column name directly uh it looks like with an equal sign why why use treat as um and the, the rest of that formula so i'll give that to you yeah so uh you could um so instead of writing treat as dinner sale shift you could just write sale shift equals dinner um i, I have a whole it's actually it's the uh Post script for one of my blogs and it kind of goes on for a while. So I could give you a really long answer. You could go find it there. Let me give you a shortish answer. You could totally do that. It absolutely works. The challenge is when you write something like uh, sale shift equals dinner, what DAX is doing is internally, it's going to rewrite that as a longer strip of code. So that strip of code that looks very easy to understand for humans, I just realized I bought this fancy light and I haven't turned it on this whole time. There we go. Let's see if I brighten my face <laughs> a little bit. So <clears throat> So you got this strip of code, right? Sales shift uh, equals dinner, right? A human understands that, that's really nice. Well, what Calculate needs is a complete set of instructions for producing a temp table. And sales shift equals dinner is not that on its own. It's just a way of comparing one value to another value. This value equals that value. The reason it works is when you write that, Calculate translates sales shift equals dinner to filter all sales shift, close parentheses comma sale shift equals dinner close parentheses now if you're saying to yourself that sounds long and complicated uh it is but it is a complete set of instructions for producing a temp table so if you write in calculate uh sale shift equals dinner it's going to translate that into the longer version and that longer version is going to produce the exact same temp table we see right here now uh, so it works is the short answer if you'll notice that only works in calculate if you try and do similar things elsewhere like sale shift equals dinner somewhere other than argument two of calculate uh you'll get an error that's because places other than calculate it won't rewrite it into that longer format so uh you could do it i i don't like the really long format the short format to me does not look like a complete set of instructions for producing a temp table this version here uh if i tell a student uh this print this thing right here produces a temp table with the wrong column name, and then we rename it. Students get the idea, oh, I get it. Argument two is a complete set of instructions for producing whatever table I want to add as a filter. So uh, this is kind of the sweet spot. It is technical enough that you see that it's producing a temp table, but not quite so complicated as the full filter, all column name, comma, column equals value, close parentheses. That's kind of why I do it like this. Also for what it's worth, if you ever uh, use the, uh, not the query debugger, but um, show DAX query in Power BI, uh, mm. what you'll find is when Power BI creates filters from things like slicers, it'll use this exact same format. So it creates a nice yep. little similarity there. Yep. Yep, yep. Excellent. Okay, so I, I gotta hurry up. Okay, so hey, uh, we added our filter here to the filter context. And now when we count rows, it's not gonna happen in this evaluation context. In fact, the sub formula, it can't see this evaluation context. It can't see anything past this little gray wall right here. The only thing it knows about its parent formula is that its parent formula slipped at this pair of lists that had the information that it needed. So when it goes to count rows of sale, it'll say, I need to go figure out which filters to apply. It can't even see this list, but it can see this list. So it looks in there and says, I need to apply a filter for house special and one for dinner. We get that filter table right there. When count rows counted, it counts, let's see, one, and uh, that is the number that we get back, which is, by the way, the number that we got in Power BI. Okay. I'll pause. Questions about that? I did have one person now, and I was uh, answering it a bit in the, the chat, but Giovanni just wanted to know is if whether or not that last example would be referred to as uh, syntax sugar. Um, yes. I was kind of mentioning that th that's, uh, at least for me, that's typically reserved for like the 
functions that are added in just to oh. simplify the writing. It, it's it's replacing what would be done with three functions with one because it's doing it in the back end for you. Yes, that's good. Yeah, so I guess it... it At least how the Italians on, describe it. Yeah, yeah that, that's fair. Um, so however you want to think about it, what you are writing, what you see is not what you get. Uh, the way what DAX executes is not what you're writing down for. It only works because you're translating it. True. But that said, uh, syntax sugar but might be a slightly different concept. Slightly different. Yeah, yeah. Oh. And, and technically, all of DAX is syntax sugar if you consider the fact that it goes in and writes T-SQL in the back end. Yeah, that's a tricky thing. So, uh, again, like DAX 101 course versus like a 401 course. <laughs> that, that, just that's, just that's peeking into it, yeah. right? One of the reasons. Yeah. So, imagine, imagine a language. Uh, that doesn't look at all like uh, German, Dutch, or English, uh, a language yep. that looks like none of those things. But when you write in this new language and you hit this button, it's able to perfectly translate what you've written into English, Dutch, and German, right? <laughs> That's sort of what DAX is. It's this language that doesn't look like SQL, but when you hit a button or when the engine hits a button, it's able to translate it into uh, T-SQL, it's translated to MySQL, uh, you know, SQL for analysis services, it does this perfect translation, which is one of the reasons it's so darn difficult. But that's I, I, I'm nerding out. Uh, <laughs> no worries. Uh, what, did, and yeah. just just one other one from uh, Hari Haran, if I'm saying your name correctly. Yeah. Uh, what if you want two? Uh, what What if you want to filter two or more values from the same column? So like a, a multi select. Yeah. So let me. I'll just I'll pull up my favorite development environment right here. Uh, oh wait, that's my list of things to do for this. So uh, <laughs> what you would do. You do like, uh, let's, oh, well, this isn't very good because there's only two choices, but that's okay. This would totally work. So, whoops. And you would do sale shift, right? So if you wanted to multi-select, uh, all you do is inside the little curly braces, uh, add a comma between each one of the selections that you want to add. Uh, can you add 20? Yeah. Can you add 200? I don't know. I think so. Yeah, I've never run out of uh, things to add. So just put a comma I mean, between yeah. each value you want to add as a filter. And that, that's how, I mean, if, if you were ever to do a multi-filter rather than the, the and statement um, in just in a, in a calculate, you'd, you'd do the uh, column name in and then curly bracket. And like you'd, you'd write it very similar to that as well. Oh yeah. So if you wanted the, the, the other way of doing it, sort of the, the standard, standard way of doing it, that if does totally formula, work. Yeah. But to me is, it, it's good. And I'll say it's the version of what I do most of the time but I think it's only appropriate to do, if you want to learn DAX, it's only appropriate once you understand the translation that it's doing in the background. So yep. you would say, you wouldn't say that, you would say in like that. Yep, da, 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 da. exactly. It would be like calculate sales, sales shift in, but that's because you wanted a formula yep. that would that only ever points to those two. But that, that's how it would be yeah. written if you were writing that in a typical formula using calculate to add multiple filters. Cause that that's just a cleaner way instead of having to do calculate uh, sales shift uh, equals dinner and either using an and or doing another comma and adding a second filter context, which is just makes right. the code longer and more complicated. That, that's exactly correct. Yeah. Um, yep. Okay. So let's see. Where, where was I? Uh, other questions before I keep moving on. I, I tend to be like a bull in a china shop and go kind of fast. Yeah. Let's. I, I have one, one more that popped up. So I'll bring this up and yeah. then uh, we, we can uh, move to the next section. So the, can you add a filter argument and calculate without having it uh, forcibly remove an existing filter? Yep. Yeah. This is, I'm guessing, related to the fact that calculate by default adds the all statement <laughs> in the back end. Uh, it, it's all column and then. Um, and then it, then it adds the filter, which is why if you use a calc, if you, if you apply a filter for a column that is in the same visual, you get all those repeating values. It look, it, it ends up looking like kind of broken. Um, it, it yeah. looks kind of funny. Yeah. So I think, well, let's see. So I think it, it, uh, the, the question could be, it, it could be a couple of different things that you're asking. In my mind, what I think what I'm hearing is let's say that I've got a filter. Uh, let's say in this, it's this example right here. I'm going to pull it up on the screen. Right. And I, I will say, based on what I just said, it, he did respond with a, a yes. So I, I think he's referring to the fact that it, it does implicitly include the all function in the back end yes. without an awareness. And I, I forget the exact reason, but I know that years and years ago when DAX was first written, there was a specific coding reason for that, which it does complicate things. But of course, you can't take it out um, because that would break so many things um, in, out in the system sure. that are built off of it today. Yeah. Uh, but it, there, there was a very there was a very specific requirement on why that was included in that way based on how power pivot worked back in excel in the day but 
Yes, to, yep. for you, that's the context of this question. Okay, so I think uh, and the, the, the answer is, uh, if you wanted, there's a couple different ways to do it. One is you can write it out the long way and you swap out the all function with the values function. But there's another way to do it too. So uh, let's say that I wanna add, uh, let's say that this isn't how special this is lunch. So it says lunch right here. I'm gonna add a filter for dinner. Well, by default, when you add a filter, if it's in conflict with an existing filter, it'll block the existing filter. So we'll go from looking at lunch to looking at dinner, right? What if you don't wanna do that? What if when you add your new filter, you don't want to remove any filters that are in conflict before? You kinda of wanna overlap them if you think like a Venn diagram. If you wanna do that, you can do the values thing I mentioned a second ago. The other thing you could do, which is here, let me make this a little easier. And uh, also the, key, the the keep filters works very well for, for um, fixing. You, you read? You are reading my mind. Yeah, you wrap it yep. in key filters. And what this basically says is when you take this temp table and you add it as a filter, if it's in conflict with an existing filter, don't remove the existing filter. So in the example of lunch and dinner, it'd be kind of funny because the filter would say, hey, only keep the rows where people bought something at lunch and they also bought it at dinner. Well, that's that's zero rows because you can either buy something at one or the other. But let's say yep. I had uh, you know, pasta and uh, burger selected before and then I do pasta and salad. Well, when I use keep filters, it'll keep the common values between them and it'll say, oh, yep. it was pasta. And so since it was pasta both time, it'll keep both of them. That's That, that was exactly. not a very good articulate answer, but keep filters is the way that you do it. Keep filters. Okie dokie, okie dokie. So uh, let's go, we have to talk about iterators. Let me burn through this real quick. So, oh, yeah, okay. So let's talk about iterators. So here's my conceptual one, then we'll get into actual practical stuff. How does an iterator create uh, evaluation context and setting row context, right? So let's say we've got uh, the sum x function and we're, we're doing it over this sale table. We're gonna run this per row formula for each row of this temp table right there, right? That's the way we think of it. So we're gonna run this per row formula once for that row and once for that row. Well, the challenge is the sub formula can't actually see directly into this temp table. In order for it to run once per row, the sum x function needs to write it down in a list, needs to write down in a list all the information for each row. So here's how that works, right? Sum x is actually gonna make several copies of the evaluation context, once per row of whatever table we give it. So because this temp table up here has two rows, some X is gonna create two evaluation contexts. It's gonna take this, make this copy here, and this copy right there, uh, one per row. Then what is it gonna do? It's gonna take all the stuff in row one and put it in this row context, and all the stuff in row two and put it in this row context. So it's gonna write down each value's row into a different row context. And then when it's done, it hands that per row formula, these pairs of lists. The top pair has the stuff for row one in it, the bottom pair has the stuff for row two in it. If this temp table was not two rows, but two million rows, uh, sum x would create two million little pairs. And in each little pairs row context, you would get the row values for exactly one row. Sounds slow, it's very, very mm -hmm. fast. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, this is a little abstract. Can we make this a little easier to see? Uh, oh, I don't know, I'll try. Let's see how we do. Let's make this more concrete. So let's say that we've got uh, this total sales measure and we filter down to lunch and how special. Well, here's our uh, measure right here. Uh, sum X, this is almost like a, a canonical measure. Sum X over the sale table, right? Go get this temp table. And for each row, multiply the quantity times the price. Let's see how that works mechanically. So we take our measure right here. And it looks like this. We're gonna pull the per row formula out into its own little rectangle right there. So let's think about the starting evaluation context for our measure. Because the user clicked on these guys in the slicers, the initial evaluation context for the measure, looks like this, two lists, a list of values the current row, which is empty, and a list of the current filters, which has all the stuff from the slicers in it, right? Okay, so what is sum x gonna do? Well, it's not gonna create one evaluation context, it's gonna create several, or two in this instance, right? It's gonna go take whatever temp table we give it and look at it and say, hmm, there's one, two rows in this temp table, I'm gonna need to create two evaluation contexts, one that has all the stuff for row one in it, and another one that has all the stuff for row two in it, and they look, like this. So the sub formula here gets two evaluation contests, one for each row of this table. And here in this row contest, you can see we get lunch, one, eight dollars, burger, burger, house special five. Lunch, one, eight, burger, burger, house special five. For row number two, lunch, three, eight, burger, burger, house special five. 
lunch three, eight, burger, burger, house special five, right? And notice all the columns that are from not the sale table, those looked up columns, the related columns, they have a little R's next to them in the uh, row context. So now the per row formula is gonna run not once, but twice, or I should say more accurately, one for every evaluation context as it ha that it has. So it's gonna run once with this evaluation context and once with this evaluation context. So when it runs in the first evaluation context, we're saying sale quantity times sale price. Well, sale quantity is one and sale price is eight. So that's one times eight, and that gives us the number eight. That's the number we get for the first row. When it runs for the second row, sale quantity times sale price. Well, here, sale quantity is three and sale price is eight. So we get three times eight, which is 24. So we get $8 for the first row, $24 for the second row, eight plus 24 is 32, which by the way, is the number that we saw in Power BI. And so that is how iterators take the initial evaluation context they started in, make enough copies for every single row of the temp table that we give it, put each row's values into one of those row contexts. And then when the per row formula runs, it has a place to go look up the values of each and every row. Okay. I'll pause, questions about that? No questions on just, uh, as always, a lot of good <laughs> additional context on expression context from Greg and a few others uh, chatting about that. Uh, my only okay. comment was the, uh, I'd love to songify your read off of the, the, the row context menu, like lunch one, eight burger, burger special. I feel like that would, yeah. that would be a great songified sound clip. Oh yeah, we could do one of those, uh, uh, where you use the, uh, what do you call it? The um, auto-tune to sort of move it up and down. Wait, too. It's, would... Exactly, I, I feel like there, yeah. there's there's apps where you give it something and it automatically puts a beat and a melody to the to whatever you're saying. I think that would be, I'm gonna, I'll see if I can do that as, as, a, as a fun highlights follow-up to, to, to this. Um, when I re-promote this next week, that, that will be you, quite entertaining. I would love that on there, please. Uh, with my blessing, absolutely do that. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so we're, we're coming close to time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, very quickly uh, go through one uh, more example, right? So here, uh, uh, basically another example of the same thing. Here we're gonna look at total cost. Uh, and this time the users clicked on dinner and regular, right? So we're gonna do total cost. We're gonna iterate over the that uh, copy of the sale table, the, the logical filtered copy. For each row, we're gonna multiply the sale quantity times the related dish cost. Let's go see how that looks, okay? So we start with our measure right here. We go ahead and pull it apart, decompose it. So we've got our parent formula and our sub formula over here, right? And now we're gonna think about, okay, what is the initial evaluation context for our measure? How do we know that? We just look at the slicers. What are the slicers on the page, right? The users clicked on dinner and regular. So the initial evaluation context for our measure looks like this. Here in the filter context, we've got a filter for dinner and for regular. So what is SumX gonna do? Well, first it's gonna go get uh, this copy of the sale table, that filtered copy right there, right? And it's gonna say, hey, when I get this, I'm gonna uh, apply filters for dinner and regular. So you can see that we're getting dinner uh, and just the regular rows right there, right? So it's uh, two rows uh, because I only have room to draw two of them, but it's a different two rows, okay? So here we've got a uh, dinner where somebody bought salad and dinner where somebody bought pasta. So what is SumX gonna do with that? It's gonna say, hey, I'm gonna copy this evaluation context one, two times. And in the first copy, I'm gonna put all the stuff from this row. And in the second copy, I'm gonna put all the stuff from this row. Boom, there we go. So now uh, SumX has created uh, the two evaluation context that our little sub formula is gonna need because the sub formula needs to run once per row. Well, that's okay. We've got all the stuff from row one written down here and all the stuff from row two written down here. So now mm -hmm. when this sub formula runs, what's it gonna do? Well, uh, sale quantity times related dish cost, right? So sale quantity, that's easy, it's the same as before, that's one. Related dish cost, oh yeah, some of these columns are from related columns, since there's a little R next to them. So the related function says, when you look in the row context, look for the thing with a little R next to it. It finds dish cost with a little R next to it, that's six bucks. So one times six, one times six is uh, math majors, six, right? Now we're gonna run the mm -hmm. exact same formula in the second evaluation context. Sale quantity times related dish cost. Well, in this evaluation context, sale quantity is two and dish cost is four. That's the related dish cost. Remember, we're using that related function. So two times four, two times four is eight. So we get $6 for row one, 
eight dollars for row two the sum x function takes those two numbers six and eight adds them together and we get 14 which is by the way the number that we saw in power bi mm -hmm. okay i'll pause any questions about that let's see no nothing on uh, on the, the current stuff so feel free to keep going fabulous okay well i will say is there anything else we need to know about rogue evaluation context uh, yeah, but not in this presentation. We've already talked about more than enough stuff. We're at like 10.55. <laughs> I need to stop talking. We covered plenty of stuff, guys. You want to know more? Uh, so congratulations. You're done. You made it all the way through uh, this thing. Oh, except for one more takeaway slide. We like these takeaway slides. So takeaways for evaluation context. Every cell formula runs with at least one evaluation context in place. These are pairs of lists that hold useful information for the sub formula. The row context has the list of all the values in the current row. And the filter context has all the list of current filters. The calculate function is in charge of making changes to the filter context. This is going to affect things like table references, which need to know which filters to apply. So by creating a new uh, evaluation context here where the filter context has changed, if there's anything in this formula that uses the filters, it now will use this new list. Okay. Hmm. Iterators like sum x, right, or average x or max x, these create multiple evaluation context each with the values of one of the rows added to the row context. This is where the per row formula goes to look up the row's value so that it could do things like add them together or multiply them or do whatever you want. Basic Excel stuff, right? So sum x takes the evaluation context it was called in and makes uh, one copy for each row of the table that we give it. And then in that per row formula, when that per row formula needs to go find this row sale quantity and this row sale price, it can find it in the first row here and it can find it in the second row there. It has all that information written down for it. And that is the basics of evaluation context. So that's it. Thank you guys so much for joining me. We made it all the way through. I wasn't sure if we were going to do it. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> hey, you just finished watching me talking for like 90 minutes or so. Uh, I've asked you for questions a couple times, but I'll ask again. Are there any other questions out there? Any other yeah, questions? Yeah, let's see. We have one just about Giovanni on like, so a matrix table has several rows, headers. Uh, I'll maybe uh, st stretch that out to assume that they're probably looking at some of the subtotals as well that are also included in that, which isn't really yep. at the row level anymore, it's aggregated. So, you know, how does the evaluation context work in a complex table visual like that? Yeah, so uh, when we start learning evaluation context, I start with the slicers because they're the easiest to think about, right? The, mm -hmm. the next slightly more complicated things is things like a matrix, where both you've got like rows and columns and also their subtotals. So the way that it works is it uses this fancy concept called context transition. The way context <laughs> transition, yeah, I know, yeah. So the way context right. transition works is when you, let's let's assume not a matrix with rows and columns, let's just assume a matrix uh, with rows and subtotals, just to make our lives a little bit easier, right? The way that DAX creates that is it initially creates what I call a breakdown, which is in the DAX query, it creates a little table, a temp table that has all the different combinations for our rows, including the subtotals, right? And then for every single uh, row in that virtual table that we create, that way that temp table, it runs the measure. And what the measure does is for each one of those rows, it goes and says, okay, I am in yep. the uh, tuna fish sandwich at lunch row. I'm gonna take those uh, values for tuna fish sandwich at lunch, move them out of the row context and into the filter context, right? And then when I'm in a subtotal row, there will be a value for tuna fish, but there will be no value for lunch. And there'll be a little bit of metadata that says, this is a subtotal row. So when it does context transition there, it's gonna move in the filter for lunch, but ignore the filter. Uh, well, it, there's no additional filter to add. So uh, the yep. short answer is it's a little bit more complicated, uh, but it's the same basic concepts, right? What it's doing is, as opposed to just creating a single number, it creates a giant table. And then for each row of that table, it says, okay, I'm here at this level of the hierarchy, either at the leaf level or a subtotal or a grand total. Yep. And each one has values that get added as yep. filters through that context transition process. So and it's you know, I'll, a I'll very, short I'll, question. Yeah. I'll very lightly touch on the on the whole like subtotals totals subject, which has had some conversations in the last like year about that. But it it is the reason that if you know what you're doing with DAX, like these the every value that you see you can essentially write the measure in a way to put anything you want in there like um you have complete freedom with a bit of skill to 
uh, to have matrix tables, column charts, uh, total labels, anything you want to, to produce anything. And most of the time it's going to produce right results. Sometimes if you have a complicated model, um, especially with maybe like financial statements or something that has uh, some cascading kind of subtotals and some other weird stuff, you can also get weird numbers on that. Um, yeah. My my only hope is is someday we we get like a a, a flip switch where it's like it's it's already built as it is today and uh, but it would be it would be nice to have a toggle to say like for anything that has like subtotals you could flip a switch to say roll up uh, visible you know because we're getting visual calcs yeah. now and just have a choice as an alternative but just keep it yes. as is you know for for those for those exceptions just to say simply I see one three and five I would like to see instead of some other number here just sum this up please and just and give me that but that. As some kind of a toggle switch and i i would i can imagine that could be a vision maybe with visual calculations but going back to that context transition everything to, to a degree is almost its own island of filter context and everything else that's happening which is why sometimes you 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 see two numbers adjacent to each other and like no these are related right i mean technically they're just doing their own thing like they're neighbors yeah. but they're having each of their own party in terms of however the the measure was written your model it was built and all of the stuff that is coming from all of the filter con auto filter context that's happening on the page uh it looks like you're flipping to maybe a slide so i can flip back to that if you want yeah so here i'll i'll, I'll show you this this is not really fully like i don't have the animation set up for it because i'm like there's no way we're gonna get through all this content uh but for what it's worth right uh so what i've shown you before is how we get a single number on a card yeah that's well and good but what if in power bi i've got a visual it doesn't look like this well, let's say that I, I create a, a, well, I'll even do it. Let's see, somewhere over here, I've got this. So let's go grab total transactions and break them down by shift. So I'm going to go grab a total. Uh, I can use my own model that I built myself. I'm going to take total transactions. I'm going to turn it into a table. And I'm going to break it by down by shift, right? OK, there we go. And to make our lives just a smidge easier, I'm gonna remove uh, the totals, right? So uh, let me make this even bigger too. Okay, very fancy. Okay, so uh, in Power BI, what did I do? I created a table visual, I dragged in shift and I dragged in total transactions, right? So this isn't a card and there's no slicers, but and yet this total transaction measure is producing a different number for dinner than it is for lunch. How in the world does it do that? Well, we're, we're skipping ahead a little bit here, but let me, let me show you, right? Let me just pull this open. So the actual code written by DAX is a little bit different than what I'm writing here. It uses this function called summarize columns, which is great, but it packs a lot of functionality into a single function, which makes it a little hard to understand. So I'm rewriting it a little bit to make it a bit more understandable. The way that this works, it uses, I'm, I'm gonna say it uses this combination of the values function and the add columns function. Mm -hmm. So what happens is when I want to create a, 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 a visual that looks kind of like this, Power BI writes a summary query that it sends to the DAX engine that looks a little bit like this. I guess it should have the word evaluate up in front of it. But basically mm -hmm. it says, hey, I want to go start by creating a, uh, a temp table that has all the different shifts in it because that's what the user dragged into the visual. So value sale shift, it produces a temp table like this that has one row for lunch and one row for dinner, right? And then it's going to add a column to it. Uh, why? Well, because the user also dragged in a total transactions measure. So we can't just show them lunch and dinner. They have to see the numbers. Otherwise, everybody's going to go home and say the Power BI sucks. So it's got to show the numbers, right? <laughs> so uh, add columns is going to add a column with the name total transaction. The name is not super important. What is important is comma. After add columns, we have the uh, measure total transactions right there, right? And so What's going to happen here is the values for lunch and dinner, the add columns function, just like sum X, it's going to add, it's going to create two new evaluation contexts, one for the lunch row and one for the dinner row. So here in this evaluation context, we've got the value of lunch added to the row context. And here we've got the value of dinner added to the evaluation context. So we've taken this temp table and turned it into two evaluation contexts, right? Now, mm -hmm. at this point, we have to uh, convert these values in the row context into filters, right? It can't just be sales shift equals lunch. We have to have a filter for lunch and a filter for dinner. So when the measure evaluates, because measures, what, how do I want to describe this? I'll use it normally. Measures have this thing called implicit calculate. So whenever you call a measure, you're actually calling the calculate function internally. What happens is when we call total transactions, it's going to use calculate to create two new evaluation contexts where it moves the stuff from the row context 
into the filter context. So it takes this current row value of lunch, and over here, it adds it as a filter. It takes this current row value of dinner, and over here, it adds it as a filter. And now, inside total transaction, we can run the formula for that measure, which is just another type of a new filters formula in these new pairs of evaluation context. It'll run it once with a filter for lunch, and it'll get all the lunch rows, and then it'll add it a second time with a filter for dinner, where it'll get all the dinner rows. And since we're yep. using the count rows function, it counts one, two, three, four, one, two, three. So we get four in the first row and three in the bottom row. And we're going to see, we're going to hope that Brian did it right. We get four and three in the thing. I got I to gotta sort this mm -hmm. by lunch. But there we go. We get four and three. So that is how context yeah, transition yeah. gets used uh, to build these visuals in a slightly more complicated way. More complicated way. Sorry, I couldn't resist. No, you mentioned I, context <laughs> transition. I had to talk about it. We're gonna do, uh, let's pop over here. We'll do two last questions and I think uh, yes. we'll use this to wrap up. So um, one will be a, hopefully an easy quick one for you, but will will you ever um, do anything again with uh, Elements of DAX or any updates on that? So what I'll say is uh, this book that I'm writing is designed to be Elements of DAX 2.0. I take all the stuff that I built with that, I figured out what worked and I keep it and I figured out all the stuff that didn't work and I change it. So in Elements of DAX, I had this concept called revisors. And so I said, calculate, it's a revisor. And I'd say it over and over and over again. And people would be like, I have no idea what that means. And so I said, all right, I won't use the word revisor. I'll focus on argument one, which is the new filters formula. It's the same thing. It's the exact same thing. I just change what I'm focusing on. As opposed to changing on how do we describe the measure, I focus on what we do argument one. So um, th the short answer is if you liked Elements of DAX and you want more, go check out the blog. That's where all that stuff is. My hope gotcha. is, as okay. I get a few more posts in, I can start actually taking the blogs and turn them into videos. Uh, but that's kind of where I'm going with it. So a uh, medium length answer to a short question. And I think one last good follow up on this is the <clears throat> considering um, also that visual level measures are are coming out and we'll yeah. try to we'll try to keep this short and sweet, but it it's a new uh, it still applies in all of the base foundations. The one additional thing that couldn't have really been done before is it is a, a it is a downstream calculation which is in a lot of ways actually really cool it it pre-calculates all the numbers for the visual first but then it uses the exact same dax logic at the filter context level to do all of its about everything evaluated is basically at the generated filter context table that you showed yep. uh, which in many ways can be super performant and i have a whole video with jay that we talk about an hour for this but um, I'm guessing of all the things to maybe talk about in terms of your your core class versus um, your your blog stuff, I'll think this will be one of the bigger ones just because it's one additional piece of the pipe in terms of downstream logic you could choose to apply. And it looks like you, you flipped over to something. So I'll, yeah, I'll um, we'll switch just, back to that. Yeah. Just to make it concrete what you were talking about, essentially the way the visual co uh, calculations are going to work, which I think me personally, I think this is the best feature that Power BI has added in years. I think this is going to be so powerful. But I don't even plan on using it that much myself. I'll, I'll use it for stuff, but oh my gosh, this is going to make everybody's lives so much easier and going to make a lot of stuff just more fluid with DAX. This is the missing feature that is just going to, it's going to take a great product and make it amazing. So if it seems kind of cool, I think it's even cooler than you think it is. That said, <laughs> kind of the way technically it's going to work is uh, in, in, in Power BI now, what uh, the query does is it generates a table that looks like this, then it stops. It hands this table to Power BI and says, okay, go draw this with different fonts and conditional formatting and all that kind of stuff. What these visual calcs are gonna do is it's gonna take this temp table and allow you to do a second pass on top of it where you can do stuff that looks a whole lot more like Excel. And that just opens yeah. up a world of possibilities. It, I think it's so cool. So, so cool. I agree. It is, um, I think that there will be a lot of clever use cases for it. my My personal favorite one is the, I myself, just considering I'm you know, such a, a hardcore like shared data set developer, well, most of my calculations will still be probably as regular measures rather than visual level. But the the performance that I can, the performance implication that I can see for like, if you have a really complex calculation previously, you're, yeah. and I, I'm on the boat, like calculated columns are, they're okay to use sometimes. Like use them yeah. sparingly, but when you need to, sometimes, pre-calculating a flag for earliest or something else that requires, you know, figuring out a bunch of stuff from a lot of tables, they can they can help to take some of the the, the heavy load and burden off of a yes. measure, move it upstream and into that. 
This yep. will have a similar process downstream where you can do a lot of the measure, but if there's some other aggregation where you have to do an X function or something else that on a hundred million row table creates a horribly slow measure, create yeah. the first one, you know, first potentially just, you know, in, in the, and then create your second one on top of that. And it's, you're now just moving it downstream rather than upstream, but either way, you're able to split out the logic and uh, um, speed up your visual. So I see a huge potential for a lot of performance optimization uh, to come from that, especially against very large data sets. So that's personally for me, the thing that I'm most curious about to poke around with when, as I start to write new measures on like large enterprise models in the future. Well, yeah, and so like one thing that I get asked to do a lot is I, you know, I build a lot of reports, right? Uh, and so a lot of times people say, can you make the, the, the visual do this? I want the bar chart to do this. I want the large chart to do this. And the answer is, yeah, I can totally do it, but to do it, I have to write one measure that exists entirely <laughs> for that chart to do that thing, right? And if you just do one of those, it's no big deal, but uh, hey, guess what? Now we got yep. like 40 charts on 70 pages. That's a whole lot of measures that are, and every single one of them in the comments, it's it true. says this visual does this thing on this exact page. That's the only thing that it does. Um, this is gonna make that process, being able to just tie, uh, A, they'll be easier to write, and B, those one-off measures, they will be tied directly into the visual. So your data model doesn't get all dunked up with all these extra measures that they're yep. there so that the line chart will do the thing that the one person wanted the one day, right? And I, and I, and I think is the, exactly. So it, it, it does reduce model clutter. Um, and e even with shared data sets where you can at least have report level measures, uh, it does help yep. to keep the core model clean. Um, but I think with visual calcs and also with the, the pipeline and the vision that Miguel has for the, uh, the better conditional formatting options in the future, yeah. you'll also have a lot less need to, to create a measure that, that produces a hex code for colors a measure that produces yeah. a title. So sometime in the next couple of years, we'll hopefully have a better UI for that where we can just like, I want a title that is a concatenation of text, this, you know, this date, this measure and this, and you just, you just build the UI and it just adds it at the visual level, it's the same kind of a thing. So uh, I do yeah. think it, we will uh, we'll have a lot less visual scoped objects needing to be added to the model as the UI gets better to just do the same thing, but it literally is just coded into the visual itself rather than needing yes. to be stored in the model, which is where it should be. Like it should be stored in the report layout file, not the model Agreed. schema file, you know? So I'm, I am yeah. excited for having to have less pain of managing that and you get that client file where there's hundreds of these custom measures that have just been shotgunned into this golden data set. Yep, that's right. Yep. Yeah, I think it's, it's a, and, and also my guess is when it, when it comes out, like the language that's used to build it will be optimized for that purpose and not for aggregation, which is what DAX is optimized for, right? So like yeah. when you look at it, it'll make sense. You'll say, I want this and I want to add this to it. It won't be complicated the way the DAX is. So yeah, it'd be great. Really looking forward to it. Absolutely. And uh, I think with that, um, yeah, we're at, we're at 11, 13, but I, I will say we have between like, we're at we're still at 25 people who've stuck with us this entire time. So that's awesome. uh, as always, people love love your content. I think, you know, I. I find that you are one of the 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 more articulate teachers that do, can do deep dives, but I think you help explain the concepts well, especially with again, you're really good at the the diagrams, and I I appreciate that because it DAX is complicated. Like there's there's no reason to lie about the fact that it is not. Um, it is getting less complicated, but it, to have a deep understanding of it, you you need to learn complicated topics. But you you do the good Star Trek. Uh, complicated topic it's it's over inflating the balloon is that like meme kind of uh situations that i i, I you, you describe the balloon over inflation well <laughs> with that so i appreciate well, you coming on and sharing that well thank you very much i appreciate it. yeah i think uh like uh i don't come from a technical background and so i know there's people who are like i know i can do this if you just tell me a way that doesn't use a lot of jargon that's what i like to do i like to take people that they, they think this is really cool i wanted how to do it i want to show you how to do it so for those folks who are in the audience right now, thank you for sticking around. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. And I'm uh, sure we'll have you back on again some point in the future, but then otherwise uh, enjoy the rest of your Friday and enjoy your holidays as well. We got uh, Christmas. I, I'm trying to have be Christmas theme and have a little Christmas lights. Uh, <laughs> I like that. Colors in the yeah, background, cool. but yeah, enjoy your holidays. Thanks. We'll do. We'll do. This has been great. I really look forward to the next one. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, take care, everyone, and have a great weekend. See you, folks. Thank you so much for watching. Please consider hitting that like and subscribe button. And if you want to help support this channel, take a look at our channel memberships or our merchandise store for cool swag.
And last but not least, please consider sharing this video on your social media platform of choice to help our channel grow. So, until next time.